Alrighty. So again, the training, the link to the training website and the Keep Teaching is in the chat. Uh, the first thing I want to show you guys is the help button right here. Underneath help, you won't have quite as many options as I have here, but there are some key things to point out. One is the search Canvas guides page. So when you click on that, it'll take you to a place where you will click on instructor so that you get the guides that are geared towards you. And it has hundreds of guides that are kept up to date by instructor themselves um, and have cover every topic that is inside Canvas. There is a Canvas community that is very vibrant. Um, you can go in here to ask the community. You can search to see if anybody else has asked the question before and see comments, or you can look uh, ask questions yourself, as well as you can look at the ideas. So, and that's what kind of the submit uh, feature idea is. Um, there are ideas that you can vote on, and basically you're like, hey, wouldn't it be great if Canvas did this? And people can vote on your idea, or you can search the ideas to see if anyone else has submitted that idea before, and you can vote on it. Most of the upgrades and changes that come to Canvas are now uh, community-based ideas that have been voted up and built into the program. Lastly, we pay for Tier 1 support, so there is both a phone number and a chat where you will get a real live instructor person. So they are the builders of Canvas, so they know Canvas inside and out, and will be able to help you 24-7. And lastly is the Travis Training Service Portal page. It is hosted by Bridge, which is another product of Instructure, and it has uh, asynchronous training as well as synchronous training. You can look on the calendar for upcoming events. You can look in the training portal for training on any particular topic in Canvas that you want. So you have guides, you have the community, uh, you can vote on ideas, you have a phone number and a chat to reach out for support 24-7 uh, as well as self-paced training. Alrighty, so today we're going to talk about LTIs and apps. We're going to talk about the different things that are built into Canvas. You can go to the SMU website, so if you go um, to canvas.smu.edu, normally you would just log in here, but there is a tab that says Canvas LTIs, and if you click on it, you'll see all of the different LTIs that we have plugged into Canvas in one way, shape, form, or another. Um, and we're going to go over a few of those today, uh, the more prominent ones that might be useful to you. And I'm just going to kind of glaze over them at first and uh, kind of maybe whet your appetite, so to speak, or find out uh, which ones you might want to learn a little more in depth about. And we'll try and fit as many in as we can in the 50 minutes that we have. Uh, if you do have questions, um, I will first I'm going to go over them all really quickly, and then I'm going to open it up to see you know which ones you might be most interested in learning a little more about. Um, but if you do have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I have uh, the ability to have a wonderful help in Steve Snyder. He's going to monitor the chat for me and answer your questions as we go along. So. Uh, Canvas has an open API kind of interface, uh, which allows other companies to build their products to interface with Canvas quite easily. Uh, it's a standard. And certain companies that we do business with do have interfaces into Canvas, and we have integrated them. And that's what we're going to look at. So for example, one that was actually built by a instructor is the attendance tool. So when you click on attendance, you'll get a list of the students uh, by section, and you can mark them as present or missing or absent. Uh, for any particular day of the month that you're looking at. And then you'll be able to build out uh, an access report. So you can do, like export this Canvas document or uh, an Excel document that has you know who was here, who was missing, and that kind of thing. And the attendance document does automatically create an assignment uh, worth 100 points, and it'll do the math for you. So let's say you're only four class meetings into the semester, and somebody has been there three out of four times, they will currently have a 75% as a grade for the attendance tracker. So this is broken down by section. You can see the different sections listed here. And uh, you can mark them as present, absent, or late to class, or these people have nothing so far. And that's for this particular day. And I can go left or right to pick any particular day I want uh, and mark them as such. We also have Box integrated into Canvas. Now, this is SMU's sponsored Box, which means uh, Box uh, at SMU, you do have unlimited storage. The first time you ever click on Box, you will uh, probably be asked to log in via SSO. Uh, but since I'm already logged in, um, I get this little cloud icon, and I grab it, 
and drag it over to the cutout and let it go and then I can see my box. And I can navigate this just like I would normally do the box folder and see everything in it. By clicking on this link here, I'm just able to either upload things to Box or work with the things in Box. Um, you would have to link it. If you wanted to link a file to the students, um, I'll, you'll have to do that inside the rich content editor, which is the um, box where you maybe like type the instructions for your assignment, your discussion, your quizzes, or a page for that matter. Uh, you could link them in using Box that way. And we could talk about that more if somebody was interested. So moving along, we do have publishers, some publishers integrated by default, like Cengage and McGraw-Hill. Uh, we do have a Pearson integration, but it is not integrated across the board. So if you have your publisher that you're working with that you want integrated into Canvas, uh, you can put in a help desk ticket if it's not already integrated, like Cengage or McGraw-Hill, and we can get that integrated into your course. It just allows you to link out to their material that they have built out. Some people have some a very simple integration. It links to like PowerPoints uh, and maybe some files. Uh, other people have a very in-depth integration built like McGraw-Hill Connect where it is basically like another LMS that you can do assignments and quizzes and stuff all inside uh, their integration. Some of those assignments if you set them up and you sync between Canvas and their their ability they can pass back those assignments and pass back those grades into the gradebook here in Canvas. Uh, we do not support uh, the publisher content integration beyond uh, the integration working and it being available to you. If you call us and say, well, I can't figure out how to use McGraw-Hill, we can't really support you there because there are so many publishers and they change so often we just can't keep up with them. Um, so we will refer you to the rep that you purchased uh, your textbook and your materials through uh, and they will be the ones to train you on the use of their product not us. Um, the next thing is the chat box and that is actually another tool built by Instructure and it is a chat function that when you go into it you'll be able to click this and see anybody else who's online that's in the course uh, and you will be able to down here chat back and forth and it's just much like texting on your cell phone you'll just see the back and forth there's emojis you can play with all kinds of stuff soccer balls all that good stuff. Um, and you can turn on this alert here. So if you have this open in the background and you're working on something else, if someone were to chat you, it would ding you and uh, let you know that there's a new chat to respond to. The next integration is Class Notebook. And this is actually through our Office 365 integration. And this is OneNote. So if you are a fan of OneNote and you use OneNote, that is integrated into Canvas. Um, but we, again, not something uh, we support other than the integration itself um, because OneNote is a vast program all by itself. Uh, the next integration is collaborations and this is an integration through Google. So if you've not set that up, you can go under your profile and into your settings and set up your Google integration, which means you basically tell it that you have a Google account and give it and uh, give Canvas your Google account information and then you'll be hooked up. And you can come in here to collaborations as an instructor and start a new collaboration, which is basically creating a Google Doc. And everyone in the class can then get in on it. Well, I say everyone, up to 50 at a time, can get in on it and work on that document collaborating in real time. Canvas Conferences is actually a, uh, sponsored by a company called Big Blue Button. And it is very much like Zoom. Um, except it is built into Canvas. Uh, there's very, a lot of similarities. You can do the conference like we're doing now. You can share the screen like we're doing now. Uh, you have a chat window. Uh, people can raise their hand or make comments. You've got a whiteboard. You can do breakout rooms, all that stuff. So it's very similar to Zoom. There are some major differences, though. Canvas conferences, when you build a conference, it will only invite and let people in that are in your course. So you cannot invite outside folks you know, with their email address and you cannot get students or people from other classes into this. It is only you and your students. If you have a TA or whatever, then they're invited to, but it is only the people in this course. The other big difference to notice is that you can record your conference here in Canvas, but it will only be available for 14 days. After 14 days, you'll be able to see the conference that you had it, but you can no longer click on it and watch the recording. You can come over here and delete it 
if you just want to get it out of the way, or let's say, for example, you did a conference about reviewing for the test, and you wanted to record it, but you only wanted to leave it up for two days prior to the test, you would need to come in here and delete it uh, so that it's not available during or after the test. All right. Moving on, we do have library help, and this is built by a company called SpringShare, and this is maintained by the libraries at SMU, and it is uh, a deep integration in the fact that it knows what class you're in. So let's say, example, this is an accounting class. The library help here would be linked to a business school librarian. It would also be linked to the uh, contact information, phone numbers, email address, the picture of the appropriate business school librarian, and the databases that particularly would be useful or helpful to an accounting class. So it is very specific and is updated by our SMU libraries and they maintain this. Uh, it's a great way to be able to get in touch or search very specific databases or tools uh, so you're not just searching all over the place. Lockdown Browser is becoming fairly popular given our current situation. Lockdown Browser, when you first launch it, comes into this great little tutorial. I highly recommend you watch it. It's only a few minutes long. It'll give you an idea of what Lockdown Browser is used for. If you want full tutorials, you can go into the video tutorials here, or you can just read the get it, Getting Started Guide and do that. If you continue on, Lockdown Browser will show you whatever, how many ever quizzes you have built in your Canvas course. This only works with classic quizzes, not new quizzes yet. So um, you can only turn it on for a classic quiz. So when I turn this on, I can go to settings and I can say, okay, I want to require lockdown browser and save and close. There's a bunch of settings in here and we can talk about that later if we need to. Um, but one of the other settings is to require monitor. And what monitor is, is it turns on the web camera and asks the student to authenticate who they are and what they're doing. And uh, we'll record them and their screen while they're taking the quiz. The brilliance of Lockdown Browser, it is a separate browser. So like Firefox or Chrome or Safari, they're browsers. And it requires you to log into this browser. And once you're in that browser, you cannot copy and paste. You cannot switch screens. It will kill, like uh, it'll ask you to kill all of your communication programs you might have open, like Exchange or Skype or a chat uh, bot that you might have open. It will not allow you to get to the internet. Um, or take screen grabs, the, all those kind of things to help prevent cheating. Now, a student could have a laptop open on the side or a phone in their lap um, or a friend behind them, and that's where a respondent's monitor comes in is that you can see that, and anytime a student might turn away from the screen or look down at their lap or someone else walks back and forth, um, there would be a flag, and it would be up to you as the instructor to review those flags and decide whether or not the student was cheating. Move it on. Uh, we do have um, the new analytics, which is a brand new integration into Canvas. Right now, it's still considered an integration, uh, but it is. Uh, we have just turned it on to be the default, uh, and it will be the default moving forward as far as analytics go for the course. Uh, initially, you jump right in here. You can see page views and activity by date. So if you roll over a particular date, you'll be able to see what they're what students have been doing. You have the ability to message students who maybe viewed a certain page, didn't view a certain page, either participated or didn't participate, and it'll build the it'll build the distribution list as, as you set your requirements, and you can message them directly. You can switch this from a, a graphical interface to a data table if that's more comfortable for you, and download this information as a CSV if necessary. By default, you come in here to participation, and you're looking at your, your entire class. You can go and look by individual section if you have your courses cross-listed, or look at an individual student to see how they've been participating and viewing your site and viewing the pages. Down here at the bottom, you can see the individual students about page views and participation, but if you sort the student up here, you'll be able to see exactly what pages and when they went to them. Resources will just quickly show you the individual views and that kind of thing. So it's really all the same information you can get up here simply by rolling over a dot. It's just laid out in a grid view as opposed to a graphical representation. You can change it from activity and page views to course grade. So now you're seeing the entire class and their grades. So this is assignment icon. I can see that this is the turn it in rubric icon or assignment. So if I roll over that dot and click on it, I can quickly see the average grade, low, high, medium, all that kind of stuff. And again, message students who 
maybe scored zero to 50, so they failed. I can message those students, or I could do anyone who got an A and message those students. I can also message the students who are missing this assignment or late with this assignment quickly and easily from the little icon here. All right, moving on, we do have Panopto, and Panopto is now our video management system on campus. Uh, you can, once you do need to come in and click on Panopto once, once you've clicked on that, you'll be able to, it'll generate the folder for your course, and you can start uploading videos or creating videos for your course. Once you drop a video in here or create a video in here, it is available for the students to see by default. If you create a video you, and you don't want the students to see it, you probably need to go right here and change the folder from the course to your personal folder and create the video or put it there first and work on it, and then you can uh, move it over later. There is a ton of settings and abilities to create uh, quizzes or maybe trim the video or you know mess with the closed captionings or the PowerPoints. When you, when you do a PowerPoint at the same time, it will actually index the PowerPoint slides. And the brilliance of Panopto is it takes the chat. If you were to do a, synchron, uh, a synchronous session and be doing this live, it would take the chat, it would take your PowerPoint index slides, it would take the closed captioning of your entire video and make all of that searchable. So students would be able to go, what was that part she was talking about, isopropyl alcohol? And they could type in alcohol, and it would jump to those points in the video where you said the word alcohol, or the slide said the word alcohol, or someone mentioned alcohol in the chat. So all that is searchable. It's a very powerful feature. As an instructor, you will also be able to see stats. So you'll be able to see who watched the video, when they watched the video, how far they got in the video, uh, and all that information here. Moving right along, uh, we do have quizzes. Now, we do have classic quizzes and new quizzes. The new quiz is still considered an integration right now. We will at some point move from the old qu classic quizzes to the new quizzes, um, but I think that's about a year out uh, before we move over. They're constantly evolving the new quizzing to give it new features and new updates uh, every month. So you can see the difference here between an icon that is an outline and an, out an icon that is opaque. The opaque icon is the new quizzes, and the outline is the classic quizzes. If you were to click on new quiz, you would get prompted to choose classic or new quiz. Uh, this is uh, new. It's got a new interface. It's pretty fancy. It's got a whole new set of question types, and it's pretty neat to work with. But right now, classic quizzes is the only thing that works with Lockdown Browser, uh, if that's of interest to you. Uh, and then the last uh, big integration we have is Zoom. So uh, we're doing this conference via Zoom. You've seen Zoom talked about all, all, all over the place lately. Um, but it is worth noting here in this Zoom, inside this course, if you wanted your students to be able to click on Zoom and see an upcoming meeting for this course inside Canvas, you would need to actually create the meeting inside this link here inside Canvas. If you happen to create your meeting time and the, using the website or outside of Canvas, you would need to share that meeting URL via an announcement or via a conversation to your students or via email from your Outlook so that they know when, where, and what the URL is. If you were to create it here inside this little iframe here, which is what this is all in, then the students could click on Zoom and see the upcoming meeting. Just a little caveat with the Zoom integration. But once you start the meeting, it will launch the client uh, just like it normally does, and it will function uh, just like you, the Zoom you're used to uh, or that you've been learning this week. So you would have all of those abilities, you know, the whiteboard, the chat, the um, being able to record the, you know, your PowerPoint, do breakout rooms, uh, annotations, all that good stuff would all be right here. So. Those are our major integrations. Um, is anything in there that somebody wants me to dive a little more into, show a little more about? So uh, I saw someone post about ProctorU. ProctorU is currently only available to um, 
the Lyle School of Engineering. Uh, they paid for it and they only paid for enough for their students. So I've got it on my screen because I can, I need to be able to get in there if I have to um, and make some edits, but it is not available to SMU as a whole. Uh, that's why SMU as a whole uses Lockdown Browser. So I'm looking at a previous co question about recording in Zoom and uploading to Panopto. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's what I'm doing currently right now. I'm recording. So when you go to Zoom, you go to the more icon and say start recording. And you will choose to record locally, meaning to your computer. When you're done with your Zoom conference, you'll get a dialog box that pops up and tells you that it's processing. And it will take a good little while to process all that into video. And once you create the video, or once the video is created, it'll take about 10, 15 minutes, I guess, it, for about 45 minutes worth of conference. And once you create that, you can upload the main video, uh, which is usually an MP4 file, to Panopto. So you would go and click on Panopto, and you would go to the Create button, and you would say Upload Media, and you would drag that MP4 from your computer to this right here, and it would upload into Panopto. And once it uploads, it will automatically start doing the machine captioning. So closed, closed captioning, but done by a machine. So they're only about 75% accurate. So uh, not quite uh, complete ADA compliance. So especially if you're using a class that's in a foreign language or a hard science with big words, <laughs> right? Um, or any particular topic with, with uh, you know, what we call million dollar words or ten dollar words you would probably want to go into that closed caption and do a little bit of editing to make sure that they got the words correctly uh, translated for you but as soon as you drop it in here and it starts processing the closed captioning it will be available for students to view um, and there is an option in the settings for each video if you want to allow your students to download the video no there um, inside the panopto uh, integration there is not a file size limit if you're doing our videos that's fairly normal yeah it's not gonna even bat an eye at that kind of stuff uh, students can uh, increase the speed of your video and watch it you know twice as fast or three times as fast uh, to where they can get through the videos faster we can't restrict that uh, but you can do a video quiz uh, and you can make that an assignment so let me just sh show real quick you would go to assignments you would create a new assignment and you would fill out all the information the title the directions and everything but instead of choosing like online submission here you would choose external tool and you would go find and you would have to go down to uh, panopto and you would then choose the video quiz that you created and that video quiz would become an assignment and if you made it worth 100 points and you gave them five questions it would do the math for you. So four out of five would turn into an 80 for the assignment. And when you do a video quiz, you can there is a setting to stop them from skipping around the video. They need to watch it through, answer the questions, watch it through, answer the question. So that could be a way you could really limit um, how they skip around in a video or not. But we don't, there's no way to stop them from skipping around in general because um, like I said, it indexes the chat your speech, your slides, and all that stuff, and that becomes searchable for the students, um, whether it's captions, whether if you did the synchrony, you have a discussion board, any notes you might put up there, if you want to upload notes to it, all that would be searchable, um, and that, of course, requires that the students be able to skip around. You do would be able to see the statistics on the video. Um, so if you click on the stats of any particular video, you'd be able to see who watched it, how many minutes they viewed, if they downloaded it, uh, and you know how far they got in each video. So there would be a way to check up on students. Uh, and you can download that stuff by viewer engagement or day by day or something like that. Why would we save Zoom locally as opposed to Zoom to the cloud? Because we do have a limit on what we can store in the cloud. And once we hit that limit, it'll start deleting. Um, we'll either have to pay a bunch more or start deleting uh, recordings off the cloud. 
So we do have a limit on the space with Zoom in the cloud, um, but you can upload to Panopto and not worry about space too much. Okay, more questions or a different LTI? Okay, um, so someone asked if there was a way to give homework or like a, but only after they watched a certain video. So there's two ways you could possibly do that. One would be to um, um, be able to set a prerequisite in a module. So let's see, if I go to a module, and if I go to, let's say, this module, and I want them to make sure that they go to this video before they can go to that, I can edit the module and say I want them to go in sequential order, or the student must um, mark as done this video. Now, a student could be like, yeah, I watched it and mark it and be done with it, but you could always check the stats on the video to see if they watched it. And so that's a way to check up on them if they didn't do so well. The other way to do it is if you create that video uh, quiz, you can ask them a question at, towards the end of the video. Um, and then part of the question, you could put the link in there and provide that feedback. Or you could use Play Pause It, which is another interaction tool that we have that puts interactions on top of the video. It can do video quizzing, it can do polling, it can do uh, like stop a video and just you can write some interesting facts and point something out in the video. So you can add that interaction that they wouldn't be able to get to the PDF until the end of the video. So there's two possible, three possible ways you could do that as far as uh, the PDF goes. Yes, so uh, someone pointed out that in the Zoom training that they received, they were told to save to the cloud. Uh, everybody was told to save to the cloud. We were told to save to the cloud yesterday, and about 10 o'clock this morning, we got a correction email uh, that said, don't save to the cloud, save locally if you can, if you know how to, uh, because we've already reached 10% in, what, like three days since we started promoting Zoom. So um, it was a correction. The initial email that went out to everybody that we had unlimited storage uh, was a bit exaggerated, we found out. So we're now correcting that mistake in the later afternoon trainings to say that we need to save locally and upload to Panopto if you can. Uh, if all you know how to do is save to the cloud, we're not going to stop you. Um, we're just saying be mindful if you can uh, because we're trying to um, be the best stewards of that space as we can possibly be, given that everyone is trying to rush to get online right now during these two weeks. Okay, so uh, just to reshow that module prerequisite, so if I'm looking at this module here, I click the three dots and I go to edit, and then I can set prerequisites, which means that would be from a previous model, or I can set requirements for this module. So if I set a requirement here, I say a student must, and if I want to say mark as done, then I can choose any of the options, like they have to mark that as done or view that item. But if I happen to have a quiz, which is a great way to do it, you could say if this quiz, they must score at least a 80 out of 100. I know that says zero because that particular quiz this is not worth any points, but you could set a, a score and say they must have an 80 out of 100 in order to advance to the next module. So you could put the PDF that you're trying to hide in the next module and they would have to score well on a quiz or watch a particular video and mark it as done before they could advance to the next module. Okay, so yeah, so someone asked about wanting to be able to set, uh, ask basically a questionnaire. So if you're doing basically a kind of poll, uh, we do have several options for that. One, if you want to learn a new tool, is called Poll Everywhere. 
um, and that's sponsored out of Simmons. It is not integrated into Canvas, but it is a polling tool that is really great and easy to use. But if you want to stick inside Canvas, you can go to Quizzes, and you can do a new quiz, and if you choose Classic, it'll open up this new quiz. And so instead of doing a graded quiz, which is the quiz type right here, you want to choose an ungraded survey. And then you can ask them all those kind of polling questions like where are you at? How do you like Zoom? Do you, you know, like synchronous session or asynchronous sessions? If you just want to gather information, the ungraded survey is the way to go. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea, yeah. So I'll try and remember to remind folks that if you're practicing Zoom or you're doing one-off meetings and those kind of things and you are recording to the cloud, to go into your recordings and delete them. So let me show you guys how to do that real quick. If you open a tab and you just Google um, SMU Zoom, the first link that comes up is the OIT services Zoom from SMU. When you go here, you click log in, and this was a way that will make sure you're using your SMU ID because we have found people who were creating the uh, Zoom accounts, like the free ones, and only having like 40 minutes to do stuff. So you want to make sure you come through here so that we use SSO. When you come into the Zoom uh, main screen, you can go down to recordings. And any recordings that you have recorded to the cloud, as you can see, my first three trainings I recorded to the cloud before I got to the email that said, oh, don't record to the cloud. So you can come here and you can um, check these and delete them. So if you've been practicing or share, you know, just doing small sessions with somebody or something that's not really of consequence anymore, please come in here and go to your recordings and remove them so that we can make room for the, the big lectures uh, and things, you know, reviews for tests, things that might be a little more pertinent, and uh, we can do that here. You can always use Canvas conferences instead of Zoom if you just want to record it for 14 days. If you think that's enough, Canvas conferences will have you covered with that. So right now, Poll Everywhere is not integrated into Canvas. You can only up upload that link and let students go to that link right now. Uh, Poll Everywhere has been promising us an integration for years, uh, but we keep asking and they keep saying, yeah, it's coming, and that's kind of where we stand for the last three years. Um, surveys, yeah, if you choose a quiz, surveys can, if you choose a quiz and you do that uh, survey uh, option, you can make the results anonymous, or you can leave them not anonymous. It depends if you want to know which student said what, or if you want to try and promote the idea that their answers are anonymous and um, therefore they might be a little more honest, you can make those anonymous uh, and you, you might get better answers that way. So yeah, if you're working with a publisher who might have a test bank, if they give it to you like on a CD, it comes with a book, um, a lot of times those questions can be imported, they're what's called a QTI file, and they can be imported into your course. So if it's a zip file, that kind of thing, you could go to settings, uh, and you can do import course content, and then under this option up here, you want to choose QTI zip file, uh, and if the publisher has formatted it correctly, you'll be able to import that quiz or that question bank uh, directly into Canvas, and then build your quiz around that question bank and you'll be able to do things like pull 20 out of the 50 questions and make them two points a piece and then you've got a 40 point quiz where these 20 questions are shuffled amongst the 50 so not everybody will have the same quiz. So that's a great way to uh, pull publisher content in. The other way a publisher might give you a um, uh, kind of a quiz or um, that kind of thing is called a common cartridge. So that might be an option for you if it specifically says common cartridge. And then the third option is that they're one of the ones with a more of a deep integration, and so their quizzes exist in their software. So if you were to click on uh, the integration once we put it in your course, if it's not already integrated like McGraw-Hill is, it would then go to their course, uh, and you would you would sync it by connecting your section to their their section to their book, 
uh, and students would then click on the link and go to there and take the quiz in their software, not inside Canvas. So those are the three different ways that publisher quizzing uh, might be available to you. So if you've already done Zoom recordings into the cloud, you can come in here and let me uncheck these. You can come up here and go to the more option and say download. When you download, it'll come to you in a folder and there'll be a few files in there, but the one, the two you're really, the one you're really looking for is the MP4 file, that's your video. That's the file you can upload to Panopto. The other files would be like a, a record of the chat, so it's like a text document. The other one um, is a file called M3U, which is like a playlist file, you don't really need that one. Um, so you really just need that movie file out of there to upload to Panopto, and it'll do the closed captioning for you after the fact. How long does it take the local to take to be there? Um, so if you record it to the cloud, it takes about, mm, yeah, I like my hour long trainings have take about 30 minutes to become available online. If you record it locally, right after you end the meeting for everybody, you'll get a dialog box that shows it's processing. Uh, and that can take about 15 minutes to process uh, at its max. And, and you'll see the, the processing bar going across the screen so you'll know how much time you got left. So somebody asked um, if on their computer, how long would you know probably an 80 minute synchronous recording with audio and video and, and a handful of students cost them? Um, it, let's see, I can actually tell you because I've got my recording from earlier. So I did a uh, 50 minute training this morning. Uh, for uh, introduction to Canvas, and we went actually we went right at an hour, and it was with about a dozen people, and they chatted back and forth, and I did most of the talking like I'm doing now, and it was 92 megabytes, so not terribly big. It's actually pretty pretty reasonable. We have heard that uh, you know. Everybody's struggling a little bit with uh, between Zoom and Big Blue Button, uh, Canvas, Blackboard. They are all struggling just a little bit to keep up with everybody, go, all the universities and all the K-12 classes going online. They're doing their best to expand their Amazon Web Services platforms uh, and paying for that. So um, I think we have to have a little bit of uh, patience with those guys, too. They are scrambling to keep up with the demand, uh, given the, the nation's current uh, situation. A ways that you can make the files smaller um, when you're doing Zoom recordings um, is to have your students turn off their video cameras, uh, just use audio. Um, another way you can do it is you know, have them ask questions in the chat like we're doing here instead of talking back and forth the whole time. Um, and you can, instead of, like if you're using Zoom, instead of showing you know, your camera and then something else if you had the if you turned on the multiple input ability you could just do a single input like i'm just sharing my screen and talking to you guys and and that's a pretty uh a cheap way of doing it i guess it'll make things smaller so yeah it, it definitely saving to your computer uh saving locally if you're recording zoom sessions is much better than saving to the cloud you don't have to worry about waiting for it to process and then turning around and downloading and waiting for that to download and then we're turning around and waiting for a re-upload so yeah definitely saving to your local computer and uploading to panopto is a faster mechanism uh, for getting your videos done and again like i said if you if you're okay with recording it leaving it for 14 days only you can do canvas conferences Yeah, and if you're going to do Zoom synchronous sessions where you're offering your lectures live to students, uh, the university has asked that you do those at the time that your class was originally offered. So if you have Monday and Wednesday class at 9 a.m., you know, set your meetings for 9 a.m. so that it's the same time the students are used to uh, to do those sessions. So something else I wanted to point out real quick is we, we talked about Turnitin real quick. Um, 
to check for plagiarism. So to check for a plagiarism with Turnitin, you want to come in here, and you'll need an online submission for an assignment. And you'll need to be able to do uh, have them upload a file, so like a Word document. And then you'll have the ability, once you've selected those options, you'll have the ability to do a plagiarism review on that. So you'll want to choose turn it in as the uh, yeah as the option to choose as the the service that we're using. Now all of these are um, the basic settings, and they you really don't have to mess with them. The thing to be aware of is the standard papered repository, um, and this means that not only the paper will be checked for plagiarism, but it will be submitted to the repository so that it can be used later to check other papers for um, to see if they've been plagiarized. So if you're doing like a rough draft for one assignment and a final draft for another, on the rough draft, you want to change this to do not submit papers because when they submit their final paper, it'll be 100% plagiarized because it'll look very similar to their rough draft. So you want to choose do not submit for the rough drafts and then standard repository for the final drafts. If you've been doing Turnitin from way back in the day, uh, it wasn't uh, an online submission like this built in. It was through an external tool. And you would say find, and you had to go find the Turnitin button and use that. Uh, that's going to go away fairly soon. We're going to remove that external tool. So if you still have those assignments built that way, they're going to break when we remove that tool. Um, we actually were supposed to remove it at the beginning of fall, um, but we decided to extend that deadline. We're probably going to remove it, I want to say, next fall, but that's what I said last spring. Um, you'll definitely want to change this to online submission, file upload, and then choose turn it in here uh, so that you don't we don't break your assignments come in the future. When, you, when you've when you finished all this and you've set all your settings and the reports come through, you'll just be able to, um, you'll be able to see the report in several ways. You'll be able to click on the assignment and then you'll see down here in a big box, uh, all the reports, you know, whether they're red, yellow, green, you know, that kind of thing and the percentage of plagiarism. You will also be able to open SpeedGrader and for any student who has submitted a, uh, a Word document or a document to be checked for plagiarism, you would see the plagiarism results right here as well. Again, a colored icon with a percentage. And then you would also be able to see it in the gradebook. Uh, you would see the colored icons for the plagiarism check on um, how badly or, or how well they did with the plagiarism check. And I think I've got one assignment that has there, so you can see, you'd be able to see them here as well. Uh, there's the different colored icons. So those are the uh, the best place though is to go to the assignment itself and look at it there. So if you're trying to do a uh, turn it in assignment and you've come on here and you've done online and you do file upload and you've chose turn it in, you come down here, you can do peer reviews on the new way of doing turn it in. You couldn't do it the old way, but if you do it the new framework way, you can still set a peer review for that. Uh, one of the things that they are working on, uh, see how you can put in a different assignment date for the peer review? One of the things that Canvas is working on is the ability to grade the peer review as well. Um, but that's coming in the future, and I don't have an ETA on that. But just giving you a heads up. All right, we just got about a few minutes left before we have to cut this session off and get ready for the next session. Um, any other questions before I let you guys go today?
You are most welcome. Um, you can always put in a help desk ticket and, of course, the help icon here to chat with someone 24-7. They won't be able to help you with the LTIs because every school's is vastly different. Uh, so you'll want to contact the help desk if you have a question specifically about these LTIs. Uh, but if it's a Canvas question, they are experts. So you can call them up or chat them up, and they will help you guys out. I'm sure that everybody's going to be busy in these next two weeks, so the best of luck to everyone. And uh, IT is here for you guys, so let us know if we can help. Have a good one.